Welcome to the Brian Callen Show. You know, um, I like doing this podcast because um, I end up talking to people that are way smarter than I am. Sometimes they're too smart, though. Sometimes it gets super confusing. Uh, <laughs> and uh, that, there's a little of that in this podcast with Wolfgang Smith. But Wolfgang Smith has been cited by people who I consider to be geniuses on the internet. He is a physicist. He's 93 years old. I drove out to Camarillo to go talk to this man. And I'm so glad I did because a lot of the stuff was over my head. But this is a guy who believes that most of physics has been approached the wrong way. See, in science, there are materialists and anti-materialists. What does that mean? I'm going to break this down for you. Materialists believe you can reduce everything down to its components. You can reduce it down to its atoms. You can reduce it to its chemicals, to its processes, to its quantities. But that never explains qualities. That never explains why a light wave sometimes is red or why a light wave sometimes is... what. Like, How do you explain the Sistine Chapel? You want to break down the Sistine Chapel? You want to break down the Moonlight Sonata by Mozart? You want to break down some of the greatest songs that make you kind of believe in God? You want to break that down into chemicals and stuff? Okay, good luck with that. Enjoy living that way. You can't. You can't. You can't apply it to the level of detail. And Wolfgang Smith says that essentially if you, and this is again, is a PhD in math, a professor at MIT, came up with one of the theorems that allows spaceships to enter the Earth's atmosphere without burning up. He's the real deal. He went to Cornell University at 15 years old. I say 16 in the podcast, but he was 15. He, <laughs> at 15 years old, he got three majors in two years. A major in math, physics, and philosophy. Then he went on to get his like doctorate in math and stuff. So his brain is bigger than all of us. At 93, he's more passionate than anybody I know at 40, at 30, at 18. So whatever's keeping him alive is clearly this fierce intellect and this passion that says, hey, Einstein and everybody else, you guys basically got it all wrong. It is not about atoms. It is not about quantum mechanics. This world is not an illusion. This thing is real. Yes, it's made of like more space than matter, but this is just as real. And science and talking about life without the notion that there is a higher intelligence, that there is something called God, that there is something about human perception that is special and can be trusted is a mistake. It's a radical notion. It probably got him, uh, turned him into a pariah among academics. But the good news is that the Nobel Prize was recently run in physics for somebody who basically proved that Wolfgang Smith is on the right track. That an atom is only an atom when it is observed and acted upon. I don't know what that means. I hope you can follow this podcast. I really, I, 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 I had trouble. I had trouble. But basically, he said that Democritus, who, is, who was the Greek mathematician, physicist, philosopher who said, you can break everything down into its atoms. Everything is made of these tiny little particles. He said that was a heresy. That was wrong. And that heresy was put to bed for 2,000 years. And then it was re-resurrected in the Enlightenment. That was wrong. And he said, Plato had it right. And everything after Plato was basically wrong. Pretty bold. Funny. And one of the fundamental things about this guy was that he went to the Himalayas and was exposed to these sadhus, these contemplative athletes, these rinpoches, these high-level Buddhist slash Vedanta adherents, mystics. And he said, they, they are the ones, they're the ones who have it all right. They're beyond the realm of time and space. So good luck following this podcast. It's pretty interesting. But before we get into that, let's talk about high art. Let's talk about humor. Let's talk about what we're... A See, there are things that we, we live within, and then there are things we live for. And there are things we die for. And I'd say that's comedy. Right, guys? Yeah. And if you love comedy, if you love comedy, you come see me in Edmonton, Alberta. The Edmonton comic strip. February 23, 24, 25. I'm going to be there, okay? Go to briancallen.com, all right? The Edmonton comic strip. Nashville, Tennessee, I'm in Zanies. 
March 2, 3, and 4. You going to come? Nashville, Tennessee? Or how about New York, New York, Sony Hall? I'm going to be in Manhattan at Sony Hall. March 11th, one show only. Tickets are going fast. Get them now. March 11th. I ain't stopping. Can't stop, won't stop. I get on a plane. I go back to LA, do podcasts. I come right back to New York. I go to Nyack. I go to West Nyack, New York. Levity Live, March, what is it? 16, 17, 18? I can't believe I can read that. My eyes still got it. My eyes still got it. 56 years old. Look at how tight this skin is. You think time and space exist, and then you look at my face. And you're like, what's going on with that American sadhu? Now, without further ado, I give you the great Dr. Wolfgang Smith. Brian Callen. This is his intro song. Brian Callen. It's one hell of an intro song. His comedy is marvelous. He's a genius in world politics. Uh, welcome to the Brian Callen Show. The world is moved by great thinkers, by uh, people who are radical enough and courageous enough to come up with ideas that buck against an entire tradition. This is the kind of thing that happens, and I'm here with Dr. Wolfgang Smith. I'm going to read his resume. I'm, I'm going to do it on my phone because it's too long to memorize, but it was just so impressive. And then we're going to get into... We're going to get into some stuff like the, the, the nature of existence and, and how maybe we've been measuring everything all wrong, all right? So this is Dr. Wolfgang Smith. He is a distinguished mathematician, physicist, and philosopher of science, born in Vienna in 1930, ladies and gentlemen, 1930. Been around for a while, so I'm going to pick his brain on the secrets of longevity <laughs> before we're done. Uh, he was living during a period of great geopolitical upheaval, obviously, um, and Dr. Smith and his family escaped both the Nazis and the Russian invasion of Poland, and you guys are worried about COVID, um, and made uh, his way to New York City on uh, a merchant vessel at the outset of World War II, once in America. Wolfgang went to attend Cornell University, one of the best universities in the world, at the age of 16. Okay, now check this out. He graduated at the age of 18. That's two years with degrees in physics, mathematics, and philosophy. That's in two years. Do you feel lazy yet? Do you feel lazy yet? In two years, he, he majored in three disciplines, physics and math, forget it, and then philosophy as well. Two years later, he took an MS in theoretical physics at Purdue University, following which he climbed the Matterhorn. He climbed the Matterhorn. <laughs> He climbed the Matterhorn. This is like, this is the, this is Iron Man's resume, okay? And, and this is not Iron Man. And published extensively on mathematical topics relating to algebraic and differential topology, including the first theoretical solution to the re-entry problem for space flight. I'm going to say that again. He came up, he worked on the, the first theoretical solution to the re-entry problem for space flight. I know you're, I'm, I'm just going to have to go with, this is just too exciting to talk about. Uh, so anyway, he found himself irre irreconcilably at odds with the prevailing zeitgeist. Dr. Smith continues to. Dr. Smith decided to forego a professional career in the fields of his primary interest, physics and philosophy, in favor of pure mathematics. Pure mathematics. And after taking his doctorate at Columbia University, he served as professor of mathematics at MIT. If you don't know what the Massachusetts Institute of Technology is, that is the holy grail of mathematics. It's like the University of Chicago for economics. Either way, the man has a much bigger brain than anybody in this room, and uh, I'm, I'm very excited to, to speak with him. I have a number of questions. I'm sorry to read off my phone, everybody, but that's a long resume. By the way, it goes on. But... Um, Dr. Smith, you, you caught my interest because essentially you are saying that the foundations of physics, the foundations of all that we can measure and how we explain the world, whether it's quantum, quantum physics or uh, quantum mechanics or Newtonian physics, the world we live in today, the things that I can measure like the, the density of this chair are all wrong. Yes, in a way, yes. And, and I would like to start with this first. I'd like to start with Albert Einstein, a man I think you've met. And I'd like to hear if you could explain to us um, the core 
contribution Einstein made for most of us who are listening are not physicists. I, we, we all know that, you know, he was the father of the theory of relativity, but, but what, what was it that Einstein got wrong and what was it that Einstein got right? Maybe that's a good way to start it. Um, is that a good place to start? Well, that's an excellent question. I know of only one thing that Einstein got right, <laughs> and that is his famous formula, E equals MC squared. There's only one catch, and that is that this formula has nothing to do with relativity theory and was actually in the literature, in the journals, long before Einstein was born. But it is a correct formula, and Einstein did derive it from his 1905 paper. But it existed before that, you're saying? Yes, it is, it is not uh, a formula which depends upon Einsteinian relativity. Most people uh, don't seem to know that. They think that E equals mc squared uh, is a consequence of Einstein's theory. It is not. It, is, uh, it was known before Einstein ever invented this theory. Can you give us, for again, for the people that are totally ignorant of physics, can you give us a layman's understanding of what E equals mc squared looks like uh, so that we can, ca we can conceptualize? Well, it, it is a statement of the fact that mass and energy are basically the same thing. And so uh, there are uh, nuclear... Uh, reactions that involve a mass deficit. In other words, the total mass after this reaction is less than what you started with. And this mass deficit is then uh, the equivalent of a very tremendous amount of energy. And this is what the so-called atom bomb depends upon uh, a radioactive substance uh, disintegrates, and in this disintegration there is a mass deficit. A little bit of mass gets lost, and since E equals mc squared, a tiny amount of mass is is lost, and that is equivalent of an enormous amount of energy. When you say the mass is lost, does that mean the mass becomes energy? Exactly. It's, okay. It is transformed. And you must realize E equals mc squared. Now c here is the velocity of light. And we all know that it is an enormously large quantity. C, in fact, is 300,000 kilometers per second. And this is squared. That's the speed of light. That's the speed of light. Okay. And so the formula E equals mc squared uh, entails that a very minute deficit in energy translates into an enormous quantity of energy. And this uh, is the basis of uh, nuclear energy. It, I mean, it, it's almost as though... If you weren't dealing on the quantum level, that's like saying if I burn this table, it's made of wood, and 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 we lose mass, but it becomes fire, it becomes energy. Is that? I mean, that's is is that the way to think about it in in this realm? Well, uh, actually, uh, from the standpoint of physics, that would not be a uh, an example. It must be exhausting to talk uh, to somebody with my to, brain to, to this point. The only point <laughs> I want to make is that. Uh, the formula E equals mc squared, which even physicists, I think, uh, many, uh, perhaps most of them, associate with Einstein. In other words, they credit Einstein with this formula. Uh, but they do so incorrectly because the formula was actually in the classical physics literature. It was there before Einstein ever uh, did his work. Where was it and how was it expressed? Well, it was in journals, technical journals, and there were physicists who knew this. 
that they, but but they didn't know that atoms existed, did they? I know that I know that in your paper, and and it's true that there there I can't remember the philosopher, but the Greeks did know that things there was something like an atom. There was that matter was comp com comprised of very tiny particles, if you will, that were invisible to the eye. That wasn't well. Let me allude to that because you raised a very very important point about. Uh, in the beginning of the 5th century BC, there was a Greek philosopher named Democritus. And he's really the father of atomism. There's a famous fragment that has come down from Democritus, which says something to the effect that, uh, according to ordinary belief, there is color, the bitter and the sweet, but in reality, only atoms and the void. Only atoms and the void. Well, uh, this uh, Democritian tenet was very much attacked by Plato and his school. And for about 2,000 years, uh, it was uh, proscribed by the informed. The informed world recognized this as a heresy. But in the 17th century in Europe, that very Democritian formula was rediscovered, so to speak. Uh, and proved. Uh, it was never proved because it is, uh, it is false. <laughs> It is a heresy today as it was in the days... So you're saying Plato was right? Plato was certainly right, and Democritus was certainly a heretic. And my point is that in the 17th century, that very, very ancient heresy was revived and became the basis of our modern Weltanschauung. Our modern Weltanschauung is based upon that very, very ancient heresy, which for 2,000 years was abandoned by the well-informed. So, but, but atoms do exist, you would agree, yes? I mean, when you split an atom, that's what causes an atomic reaction, etc.? Well, they exist in a technical sense, but not in the sense in which people understand it, including physicists. Um, the atoms exist in the sense that a branch of physics deals with them, the branch known as quantum theory. Yes. And the point about quantum theory is, uh, as Richard Feynman, that brilliant American physicist, put it, no one understands quantum theory. I think it is true uh, that based upon the usual interpretation of physics, quantum theory is not comprehensible. It's not comprehensible? No. So that, then are you saying quantum theory itself is completely wrong? No, no. Quantum theory is correct, but it is not comprehensible in terms of the philosophy of physics, which basically has been adopted since the 17th century. The, the basic principle which um, underlies our normal understanding of physics is what the British philosopher Alfred North Whitehead termed bifurcation. And what does bifurcation mean? This is the philosophy introduced by René Descartes in the 17th century. And basically what Descartes did, he split all reality into two parts. The first part he called res extense, that means extended entities. And these are the entities that uh, exist in space and are the subject of physics. Like a chair, person. Yes. These are res extensa. Things you can see and measure. And everything that is not a res extensa is what Descartes called 
res cogitans, a thing of thought, a thing of the mind. So Descartes split the universe into these two halves of, of thought he did, and the outer half is the space-occupying things, and uh, this is what the physicist deals with, and everything that is not the space occupying is called a res cogitans, a thing of the mind. Right. And this is what Whitehead called bifurcation. And Whitehead lectured in physics departments all over the world, uh, explaining that it is a false idea, that it is impossible, that it is metaphysically invalid. So Car the Cartesian model is invalid? Yes, the Cartesian philosophy is invalid. Okay. And in fact, uh, Whitehead went out of his way to uh, convince physicists that the result of this axiom has been what he called a complete model in our understanding of physics. And then he complained, but any attempt to uh, explain to physicists what this model is and why it is a model uh, uh, has fallen on deaf ears. Uh, Whitehead himself lectured in England and America for decades uh, trying to uh, uh, enable basically the physicists to, ex to understand this point. And he finally gave up and said, I cannot do it. Was that because he didn't have anything to replace it with? No, I think the reason is that the notion of what Whitehead calls bifurcation is so ingrained in the physics community that when you try to explain it to a physicist, the physicist can't get it. I mean, I, I myself have had that experience. Uh, if, if you try to explain to a physicist what bifurcation is, chances are overwhelming that he will not get the point. And, and the reason is that it is so ingrained in his thinking... It's an orthodoxy. ...that he thinks it's just the way things are. Mm. So... Uh, and you, you, you are... Your contention, and Whitehead's contention maybe, is the idea that there is a third... There is not a bifurcation, but maybe a tri... You call it a tripart? Well, you see, the... the a Cartesian idea of bifurcation has a very amazing consequence. Namely, the consequence of Cartesian bifurcation is that we do not perceive the external world. If Descartes were right, then what we perceive, the, the green grass or the red rose, is a res cogitans. A thing of the mind. It's not reality. It's your mind. Yes. It's your limited sensory apparatus playing a trick on you or whatever. So uh, right around the time of Descartes in the 17th century, a theory of visual perception um, presented itself to the uh, scientific world, which is more or less accepted to the present day. And what is that theory? what is called the retinal image theory, light strikes the retina from the retinal um, uh, the rods and cones, electric signals go into the brain to what is called visual centers, there are about 20 or 21 of them, last I heard. Mm -hmm. And uh, the story gets tremendously complicated. Uh, and... The idea was that somehow what we see is in the cortex of the brain. We somehow see uh, neurons in on and off positions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, in the meantime, two things have happened. One is 
that this theory of visual perception, when you look at it uh, with a little bit of care, you, you discover that it makes no sense because uh, what we see is a unity, a landscape, what, what artists paint. We do not see a million or a billion neurons in on-off positions. That's not what we see. Mm. And so this is called the binding problem. And finally, it has dawned to the more critical, more philosophical cognitive psychologists that this retinal image theory is unbelievable. Uh, because what we do not see neurons, we see uh, mountains and trees and fields and color and so forth. So this was called the binding problem. Well, I think Nietzsche's, Nietzsche's way out of that was to say that there are plural truths, right? So it is true that that painting may move you emotionally because you see a painting and you see the entire landscape. So it could bring you to your knees if you look at the Sistine Chapel. And a chemist would say, aha, you think that's yellow, you think that's blue, but that's just your brain playing tricks on you. In fact, it's something else. Well, that doesn't really get you off the hook. No. Because... The fact of the matter is that if it were the case that uh, what we perceive are neurons in, in off, on or off states, a million of them, uh, this uh, is all very nice. But obviously, that's not what we see. We see a landscape. Right. So you're saying even if it's true, it's not relevant. Well, I'm saying it's not true. Visual <laughs> perception is not... Uh, it's not an illusion. It, it's not an illusion. And uh, let me say that in the, ninth, in, the, in the 20th century, in America, there was a very remarkable cognitive psychologist by the name of James Gibson. He, uh, he was commissioned in 1941 to work out for the government visual tests which they can use to identify prospective pilots. And so this started him to think about the information given on the retina and he, he discovered in 1941 that the information given on the retina does not suffice to, um, uh, to see the uh, landing point of a complex motion. This is a mathematical problem. Mm -hmm. And obviously the government was interested on account of landing planes on the deck of an aircraft carrier. That was a practical issue. And what James Gibson discovered in 1941 is that the information given on the retina does not suffice to land the plane on the deck of an aircraft carrier. Right. And so he was a brilliant man, this James Gibson. So at one stroke, he realized that the visual image theory of visual perception, the retinal image theory of visual perception, I should say, cannot be true. Because it's not, because it's so limited? No, because uh, you could not, uh, you could not move, uh, you, you could not uh, land a plane on the deck of an aircraft carrier. With your eyes? If the visual, uh, if the retinal image theory is true, if the information in visual I perception see. is see. all so derived he's saying from it, the it, retina, it, it, mm. uh, we could not land planes on the deck of an aircraft. And he's saying, but since we can land planes on the deck of an aircraft. Obviously, yes. Yeah, and, and there is a tangible reality to that, a life and death you know, uh, yeah. stakes to that. 
the fact is that you can trust what your eye sees because i mean that's that's as that's as objective as you can get yeah well uh, basically uh, james gibson discovered on these grounds that i've just explained that this long standing visual image theory of a retinal image theory of visual perception is untenable and so he started from scratch Uh, looking for a uh, a new way of understanding visual perception, and after about thirty years of brilliant empirical work, he came out with a theory which he called the ecological theory of visual perception. So, ecological—that is a reference to the environment. What Gibson was saying is that what we actually perceive is the environment. And this was a tremendous breakthrough. Uh, I was uh, very happy to see that the academic uh, community, after examining the work of James Gibson, they made him a member of the National Academy, they honored him, and uh, a, a large number of Cognitive psychologists today are convinced that the Gibson theory of ecological of visual perception is true. Uh, let's take a quick break. Today's podcast brought to you by Ketone IQ. Let me explain to you. Let me explain to you about ketones and Ketone IQ specifically. Here's why I ended up actually being intrigued. They sent me some. It tasted like rocket fuel. My wife was like, this stuff tastes not that good. And I thought to myself, that's interesting that they're, that they're kind of marketing this brain slash body fuel and they didn't take the time to make it taste really delicious. It's kind of like when you eat liver. You ever eat dried liver? It doesn't taste good, but you know it's super good for you. So that was the first thing I went, there's some legitimacy here. Then I found out the Ketone IQ... Uh, signed a contract with the U.S. Special Forces, okay, people who need measurable results in their brain and body activity, uh, you know, because sometimes they're dealing with life and death situations. So then I find out that Ketone IQ was developed by, with a grant from DARPA. So that would be the science wing of the Department of Defense. Then I find out that a lot of people on the Tour de France, Tour de France, uh, take ketone IQ. So now I'm like, okay, if I'm going to have somebody that's going to sponsor the Brian Callen show, I got to believe in it. I got to, I got to know it's got measurable results. Then I start taking it. I start trying ketone IQ. And all I'm going to say is this, try it for yourself. I want to hear what you think. Cause I swear to God, I feel it in my hands and my fingers. Apparently your body is running a lot of times on glucose and when you take ketone IQ, your body's running on ketones. Kind of like your body's running on the fat stores in your body. It's a cleaner fuel. I don't know how it works. I just know it works. I feel it. I feel the difference. And so you may think it, it's, a, it's a placebo effect. Because sometimes you're like, oh, this feels amazing. Well, not so. Why? Because the special force of the United States just signed a contract with them, created by DARPA, and the Tour de France athletes use it. So that's all I have to say. Ketone IQ, try it for yourself. And I want to hear what you guys think. Go to HVMN. What does that stand for again? That stands for Health Via Modern Nutrition. So HVMN, Health Via Modern Nutrition.com. All right. Use promo code Brian, B R Y A N, my first name. Check out to save 20%. Um, and uh, it's brain fuel. It's clean energy. That's all I have to say. It's, it's a boost without sugar or caffeine. Try it. I stand behind it. I'm proud to represent on this podcast. Now let's get back to the program where we, you know, have to think very deeply. So we do perceive the external world. The grass is green. The roses are red. And this, this means that the physicists... Um, don't know the whole story. 
because if physics were correct as it is now understood, the grass would not be green, and the roses would not be red. In other words, uh, if you take the physicists at their word, what they have to tell us about the external world, they would say that the external world does not admit any qualities. For example, color. Uh, so the fact that color is uh, indeed a, a true ingredient of the external world is in, uh, in contradiction to the uh, ontology that almost every physicist assumes to be true. Yes, because they would say to you, for example, this feels like matter, but it's mostly space. So at the quantum level, um, everything you think is actually real, it might be inversely related. So this is mostly, I don't know, atoms and the force between the two. You can't see an electron. They behave very differently. You've got the entanglement problem and all these things, right? And there's, so there's a whole world that you can't see on... Uh, on a quantum level, and sometimes the very nature of gravity and light is behaving differently than it does in the Newtonian world, in our world, in the corporeal world. Uh, yeah. Basically, our physics community assumes precisely the philosophy of Democritus at the beginning of the 5th century. But isn't there room for that? Isn't there room for both models? No, there's no room for Democritus. Uh, and in fact, as I said, he was disproved by all the serious philosophers of antiquity, beginning with Plato. And for about 2,000 years, the philosophically informed world understood that uh, this atoms and the void philosophy is a heresy. And what's important, you're saying, is it's not so much disproving the idea that maybe things are made of atoms and voids and quarks, and we can get into that. That's not the point. The point is what that, what that orthodoxy and adherence to just that theory does, excludes, because it leaves no room for another reality, which is the fact that you cannot measure the mind, you cannot measure imagination. There, there, is, no, there is no space when it comes to the mind. There may be time, but no space. Right there, 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 there is no room for the idea that there is something called a soul. But can you can you talk? Can you dilate on that? Can you dilate on the notion well, of soul? First of all, I say that um, you must distinguish two physicists. There is uh, the technical guy, and he's he's the one that tells the engineers how to build. Uh, electronic equipment, how to build all the marvels of modern technology. They're all based upon physics. So there is a physicist who is the expert in uh, how to build things. He can advise the engineers how to do it. And obviously... Here we are dealing with truth. Here we are dealing with knowledge. But there is also uh, the physicist who will tell you, for example, that color is in your mind. It's not in the real world. Hmm. And here we have a man who is two things at once. He's a physicist and he's a philosopher. Now, he may be a good physicist, but he's a bad philosopher because what I have just quoted him saying is false. Color is as much uh, an ingredient of the external world as, say, matter. Mm. Mm. And uh, I, buy, I buy into that. That makes sense. So what uh, philosophers have been often ridiculing as, quote, naive realism happens to be good philosophy. 
And it sounds to me like you can't separate. A good physicist has to be a philosopher, and maybe a good philosopher has to be a physicist, but not as important. Well, most physicists, good and bad, are bad philosophers. They're bad philosophers. There's, there's no question about it. Would you put Feynman in that category? Definitely. Definitely. The only thing I'll say in ex by way of excusing Feynman is this. Um, as a philosopher, Feynman was a pragmatist. I don't know what answer he would have given to the question, is the grass really green or not? Is the green just a res cogitans? I don't know what answer Feynman Sorry. would have given right. to that. Uh, he may very well have said, well, this is metaphysics, I'm not interested in it. Uh, he was, I think, more of a pragmatist in philosophy than anything else. And incidentally, this is kind of um, parenthetical, but he has actually had the long-term effect of Feynman upon physics itself has been negative because he has introduced pragmatism into physics and it doesn't work. It doesn't work. No. So how do we... How do we integrate spirit, soul into physics? How do we do this? How do we, how do we, how do we use your model of measurement? We do not integrate spirit or soul into physics because physics has nothing to do with spirit this, or this soul. This is philosophy. The important thing is to understand what physics is and what it is not. Okay. And a lot of confusion has been uh, spread for a long time, ever since physics sort of became the, 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 the great philosophy of our time. Uh, a lot of confusion has arisen because we attribute to physics something that physics cannot offer. Uh, physics is wonderful at offering uh, quantitative answers to quantitative problems. Ah. But when you uh, elevate physics to a metaphysics, it's disaster. Then you're back to Democritus, you're back to the oldest and most flagrant heresy in the history of heresy. <laughs> so when you want to understand maybe what's important or the nature of existence, you have to, your, your argument is you have to bring metaphysics into it. You have to bring spirit. You have to bring soul into the equation. You, you, you cannot, I guess that's the difference. I guess you're more of a philosopher in many ways than you are a mathematician and a, and a, and a physicist, even though you're both, yes? Well, am I, am I, I'm, I hope I'm not missing. No, it. no, I, I'm completely happy with ancient Platonist philosophy, I think it was a correct philosophy, and all the confusion has come in in the 17th century when René Descartes uh, came up with his idea of bifurcation, and he revived the oldest heresy in the world, and that oldest heresy in the world became the prime metaphysical postulate of modern civilization. And so for 400 years, all the young people who have a higher education in philosophy have been deformed. They have been taught on high authority to believe things that are simply not true. Is this why so many academics, whether they're philosophers or physicists, are, are strong atheists? Yes, certainly. Once you buy into bifurcation, uh, you don't necessarily have to be become an atheist. Uh, René Descartes himself was very far from being an atheist. 
And you see, the, 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 that's the, ironic. The funny thing is that he invented this idea of bifurcation when he was isolating himself in the garden retreat. He's, I don't know how long he spent there in seclusion. And he finally came up with this idea of bifurcation. And then, after he had come up with the idea of bifurcation, he sort of scratched his head and said, how do I know that this is really true? And so he continued to meditate how he could prove or verify the truth of bifurcation. And the interesting thing is, there's only one argument that he came up with, and it was what he called the veracity of God. Now, uh, how he conceived the veracity of God as proving bifurcation is another subject <laughs> that I don't want to go into. I just find it amusing yeah. that this ancient heresy was justified by its inventor uh, on the basis of what the inventor called the veracity of God. Of God. So God himself approves of my philosophy is what it sounded yes. like you were doing. So, uh, you, but you bring God into your, you bring some kind of a concept like that into your, your paper. Fair to say? No. No. I mean... Uh, um, Man is tripartite, corpus, anima, spiritus. Okay. And according to Plato, the cosmos itself is similarly tripartite. And you cosmos. believe that? You believe that man... Fully. I, I'm a Platonist. I've been a Platonist all my life. So, so, so man is corporeal. Man has got this physical body. Man has a mind. And then you say man has a soul. A spirit. A soul spirit. and spirit are two different things. Explain spirit in your words. Well, spirit is beyond both space and time. Is that imagination? No, it's no. it's it's being. It's it's reality. Mm. And in fact, all being, even here on in the corporeal world, derives from that uh, Platonist being which is beyond space and time. Uh, this is what I call irreducible wholeness. Yes, yeah, I wanted you to talk about that. So irreducible wholeness is a wholeness which is more than the sum of parts. And what this means from a metaphysical point of vantage is that this irreducible wholeness actually derives from a plane of the cosmos which is above space and time. You can't prove this mathematically. You can't prove this with physics. It, this, 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 is, this is something you, you have to prove, I suppose, or it's a theory that you, you, ha you have to just state based on what you see and what you feel. Is that fair? Well... In my younger years, I spent seven months in India living amongst yogis, the real thing. And what do yogis do? What, what, what do they do? Well, what they do is the cosmos consists of these three levels. The corporeal, which is subject to space and time. The intermediary, which is subject to time alone, and the intelligible, which is subject neither to space nor to time. So there are these three levels. And incidentally, in India, there's a Sanskrit word for, this, for the tripartite cosmos. It's called a tribhuvana, that means a triple world. And I found in India, when you speak to an educated layman, you, you can talk to him about the Tribhuvana. He's aware of the fact that there is such a there thing. There are different levels. So, there, so what I'm saying is that in India, what yogis do through 
disciplines that are unimaginable. I mean, this is not something you learn uh, as you learn ordinary things. Uh, but what he actually is able to do is he's able to elevate himself, pass through this intermediary, and actually uh, exist consciously on this third level. So to a young person looking to, I suppose, reach enlightenment, full understanding, participation on the highest level, what would you suggest? They go to India and practice Oh, yoga? no, no, no. This is out of the question. <laughs> out of the question. Uh, f first of all, uh, a, a, a real sadhu won't even accept a Western disciple. Mm. Most of them won't because uh, it is meant for their people. I mean, this was given to them. The Vedic religion is the oldest in the world. It antedates the birth of Abraham by about a thousand years or so. So uh, this is something amazing that this religion was handed down from master to disciple through thousands and thousands of years. And as I said, when I was there 50 years ago, it was still practiced and practiced successfully by thousands of sadhus. Incidentally, if you want to follow that path, uh, uh, celibacy is a sine qua non. If you don't want to be a celibate, then forget about <laughs> yoga. Because you have to is, be a celibate. It is not, it is not accessible. It's a, fierce, it's a fierce way of living. And incidentally, you found the same thing in the Platonist Academy. It was completely... Uh, celibate. Mm. And there was a lifelong vow of celibacy. Wow. And, and uh, was that to separate yourself from sensation? Because you say that sensation is not the same thing as perception in your paper. You uh, make a distinction between sensation, sensation and perception. Well, yes, they're different things. They're course. different things. And to perhaps, perhaps to reach the highest level of perception, maybe you have to lose your attachment to sensation? Well, it depends. We all have perception on the corporeal level. In order to, get, <coughs> to gain perception on the two higher levels, uh, a yogic path is necessary. Have you, have you reached those higher levels? No, I was never, <coughs> uh, it was never my goal, but... Uh, I know in, that in India, you, when I was traveling there half a century ago, you could meet people who had these powers. But they are, you, not, you, they yeah. are not obtainable on the cheap. No. It's a lifelong yes. education. It, it, it's, it sounds like, an, like what the Buddhists call enlightenment of, of some sort. Well, no. I mean, enlightenment comes way at the end, but even to take the, the baby steps... In yoga, why didn't why didn't you want to do that though? Because you're you're a believer in this, and you your life's work in, it seems has been to prove that this is what's well, missing. When I actually came to India and lived among these people, I I gained the highest respect for them. I respected them greatly, and they knew it. And but. I soon enough realized that this is not my path. This is not my vocation. Yeah, because you were gifted in math and physics and things. Well, vocation is something that is somehow given to you by God. Everyone has it, although not everyone is aware of what it is. But um, uh, Shakespeare put it nicely. He said, unto thyself be true. Mm. Uh, and... Uh, so I'm, I'm a great believer in this. Uh, we do not choose our vocation that is given to us. And if we are uh, wise, we will follow our vocation, which is not always easy because it is not even easy to discover what that is. Do you believe in an Abrahamic God? Do you believe in a Vedic God? Do you believe in a 
Is, is there a difference? Is it worth even the question? Or is it enough to just believe in a higher intelligence? No, no, it's not enough to believe in a higher intelligence. We must uh, belong to a religion, and the religion is not a man-made thing, it's a God-made thing. And uh, I, in India, I became acquainted with the Vedic religion. I respect it very much, and uh, I have learned much from them, but I discovered soon enough that it is not for me, this is not my religion, I, it is their religion, and uh, so I, I distinguish sharply between the Vedic religion and the Judeo-Christian. The, the Judeo-Christian is something entirely different, something that the Vedic savants do not understand, there are no words even in Sanskrit for uh, Judeo-Christian conceptions. For example, uh, in Sanskrit there is no word expressing the Judeo-Christian idea of sin. The, as everybody knows, the Hindus believe in what they call karma, and so if you do good deeds, you will have a good effect. If you do bad deeds, bad things will happen to you sooner or later. That has to do with karma. That has nothing to do with what we call sin. So uh, it took me a long time in my life to understand that the Vedic religion is what it is, and it's tremendous. I mean when you have the good fortune to meet somebody who is advanced some distance in this Vedic ascent, it's an ascent to God, uh, th there's nothing quite as powerful that impinging upon you than the presence of someone who has drawn close to God. Was this an inspiration you had? Did you have your road to Damascus moment, or what was it? Well, uh, I was uh, a freshman at Cornell, and I happened to come upon a book by Rabindranath Tagore. He's a Hindu poet. In fact, he won a Nobel Prize in literature for a little poem he wrote called Gitanjali, means literally a little song. And so I began to read Gitanjali, and it moved me very deeply. And so then one thing led to another, and I began to read Hindu authors. This was all while, by the way, majoring in physics, math, and philosophy, yeah. ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. And then he's got time to read Hindu philosophy. Well, it fascinated me. I mean, I'm sorry, me. Hindu poetry, yeah. It fascinated me, and... So then I had the great desire to go to India and, and meet these wonderful people. And uh, however, as things worked out, I, I didn't have the opportunity until after I had my doctorate. I had my doctorate, I was teaching at MIT, and I, dis and I took an assistant professor professorship at UCLA, and so then I had seven months from the ending at MIT to the beginning of UCLA with nothing planned, so I took the time off and went to India. So I spent seven months in India, and I didn't spend my time in Calcutta and New Delhi. I went up into the Himalayan uh, regions where the sadhus live, and I lived as close to the sadhus as I could. What was it about them? They don't say much. What was it about them that got you so mesmerized and where, where you realized they might be in touch with a higher reality? Well, uh, I can answer this in one word, but the, I don't know how much the word will mean unless you've been there yourself and experienced it. The one word is spirituality, and they have that. And I realized quite... Quickly, when I uh, began to live amongst them, um, 
that I can't have any idea really about where they are. Most of about 20 hours out of the day, they are in trance. They, if you were to take a knife and put it in their flesh, they wouldn't know that you're doing anything. They're not in the body. And the, the first time I realized that that was a reality, or I should say, the first time I realized that there was something there, there, there was something um, that contemplative athletes like these sadhus understood that I didn't was when I, yeah. I saw the pictures of the Buddhist monk who lit himself on fire in protest of the Vietnam War. And if you read accounts of that, he didn't move. He, 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 one of his students poured the gasoline on his body. He was in the position of the lotus position or whatever. And then he lit the match himself. And all that happened was some air left his lungs as he passed and he just fell over. You know, th that's where I realized yeah. whatever this person was touching was yeah. a different reality than any of us. I agree with you. You are yeah. absolutely right. That's it's a different the, reality. And, uh, I brought only one thing to these encounters, and that was a deep respect. I realized these are people that have uh, gone so high in the spiritual quest that they couldn't even tell me about it. I mean, um, if they spoke yeah. the right words, I wouldn't understand. It's something what you have to means. experiment. It's, it's something you have to experience. It's probably the definition of a mystic. A mystic can't explain to you the level that they're at. It's something you would have to. It's a journey you would have to take. There's not. There are no words sometimes, right? For, for no, well, I mean, there are <laughs> Sanskrit words, but you you don't understand them until you yourself have had. I, I, I love seeing how passionate you are. Born in 1930 and still passionate about uh, the big ideas. And uh, Yes, I'm, I don't know. I might be more passionate now than I was before. That's because. inspirational. That's very inspirational to me. Why, why now more than before? Well, maybe because I'm closer to the transitus. <laughs> when, when you are, I mean, you cannot but reflect upon uh, the great mystery of the beyond, and uh, I don't think there's any human being, uh, except people who are perhaps insane, who are not deeply, deeply interested in this issue. If they, if they say they are not, I think they are trying to somehow talk themselves out of it. Mm. They are. We all are. Thank you very much, Doctor. That was, uh... Thank you. It was a pleasure.